Part 3 Replacing the dead onboard SSDs. In this section, we will show you the SSD replacement methods for the M1 Max, M1 Pro MacBook, M1 Mac, T2 Mac, as well as the T1 MacBook. This video will highlight the working practice we've applied to identify dead SSD issues, as well as the general symptoms you're gonna get when the soldered SSD dies. And since we already made some money by repairing this problem, we wanna teach you folks to do the same and save all these Macs from the landfills. But before we begin, we need to ask you this one simple question. Would you be mad if someone fixed your dead SSD MacBook with a used worn out SSD? And this particular SSD has 200 terabytes written with only 84% lifespan left. Can you accept this secondhand SSD inside your MacBook? Keep this really important question in your mind until the end of this presentation and you will understand why we make these videos. In order to understand what you need and the basic principle of solid SSD replacement, we need to start with the T1 MacBook first. There are four Intel MacBook models with T1 chip and we have listed them here to make it easier for you. These are the very first generation of Touch Bar MacBook Pros that were produced in 2016-2017. So if you open up the bottom case of the MacBook, you will be able to locate the solid SSD location on the right side of the MacBook. If you are familiar with the logic board by now, you should already know that this is the logic board for the 15-inch MacBook Pro and the right ones for the 13-inch touch bar MacBook Pro. The soldered SSD is actually well protected under this EMR shield, so prying the metal shields will expose all SSD components one by one. So as you can see, the SSD on this Mac consists of two different components. The first one is called NAND chips, where all of your data are actually stored, and the second one is the SSD controller. The NANDs are connected to the single SSD controller, and this SSD controller is hardwired directly to the platform controller hub or PCH through the high-speed PCI port at 4 lanes PCIe 3.0. So let's just move them to the side now. And if you flip the logic board to the other side, you can see several ICs and another EMI shield on the left chicken wing. This is the Apple T1 chip. It's also soldered to the logic board and controls the function for Touch ID, Touch Bar as well as Apple Pay. And believe it or not, this T1 chip is also connected to the PCH but only to the slower USB port. This is the reason why you can find the T1 controller under USB drop down menu in the system report. On the same side of the logic board, you can also notice one tiny chip near the bottom edge and this chip is called SPI ROM or BIOS chip. This IC is so robust that it can write around 100,000 right sides cycles that only used to home a critical low-level firmware called Intel UEFI. This firmware is just a tiny 8MB size but she is so critical that it will determine whether your Mac is going to be a MacBook Air or maybe a MacBook Pro or iMac or even Mac Pro and it is also connected to the PCH using the SPI protocol. With all of that being said, the Intel UEFI is responsible to make your MacBook to actually dong or turns on and show display on your LCD. Right now, if your soldered SSD died from TBW or or maybe failing SSD controller, you can still turn on your MacBook, but it will show the question mark folder icon like you see here because the logic board cannot find any SSDs or macOS files. You can pretty much say that every component on this logic board is working good, but your soldered SSD has died resulting in the question mark folder. Now, why do we seem to really care about all of these components? Well, I need you to remember this block diagram as we will guide you how Apple's going to redesign this block diagram into T2 Max as well as transforming it to M1 Max family that will greatly impact on how you could replace your soldered SSD. Now, in order to replace or upgrade this dead SSD, what you basically need to do is to remove the single SSD controller together with the NANDs from the logic board and replace it with other third-party NVMe SSD widely available on the PC markets out there and connect it to this PCIe X4 lanes here. But how do you connect the SSD when there's no NVMe port at all? All that you have on board are the soldered NANDs and controller. Well, you can add the NVMe port by removing all existing hardwares like the NANDs, SSD controller, capacitors and resistors from the logic board to make space. 
Next, clean up all the solder traces with wick and all the messy epoxy until everything is flat and smooth. Some of these exposed copper pads are actually PCIe X4 lanes, so we will manipulate these exposed PCIe lanes by aligning a specially designed BGA adapter directly on top of these PCIe pads. This BGA adapter basically reroutes all these exposed PCIe lane pads to this M.2 NVMe SSD connector so that you can put any compatible M.2 NVMe SSDs available on the M Amazon or eBay and now the MacBook storage is removable, expandable and good as new and the bottom case will fit the modifications perfectly well. After that, all you gotta do is to format the macOS into the new SSD and this MacBook will have the chance to live another life. This NVMe adapter has helped people around the world to repair logic board even with holes through the SSD, solving numerous A1706 and A1707 MacBook with dead SSD issues as well as upgrading the MacBook storage to 1TB capacity and so far the largest capacity available for this upgrade is 2TB. É, já tá aqui a instalação, é, fiz todo o procedimento mostrando, compartilhando no YouTube. Então tá aqui um M2 Soldado no Mac. These custom NVMe adapters and their stencils are available on the links in the description below. Next, we will move on to the T2 Max. Pay your attention really close to this one because it has a really similar concept to the M1 Max. Now, what we have listed here is all the T2 Max ever released by Apple from the most expensive to the cheapest price tag. All these Macs have two things in common. First, they're using Intel CPU and PCH and second, they all have the Apple T2 SoC integrated to their logic board as a coprocessor. You can easily find this T2 chip once you open up the bottom case of your MacBook and remove EMI tape covering the T2 chip using knife and alcohol. Then you should find the soldered NANs near the T2 chip, two NANs on the top side and another two on the bottom side of the logic board. Now, this is how Apple fits the T2 chip components on the logic board compared to the previous generation T1 Mac. This time, the T1 SoC is completely replaced by the Apple T2 SoC chip but it's not connected to the USB port anymore. So instead, the T2 chip is now taking the place of the SSD controller and connected to the PCIe X4 directly to the PCH. Since the SSD controller has been replaced by the custom Apple T2 chip, well, now the T2 chip itself functions as the new SSD controller. But it doesn't stop there. It has its own CPU and now functions as System Management Controller or SMC, FaceTime, Touch ID and Touch Bar Controller, Audio and Sound Processor, Intel ESPI Host, as well as several other critical things that's too long to be listed here. And since the T2 chip was customly made by Apple, they actually replaced the old NANs with their specially designed NANs too. These NANs are so special that you won't be able to find them in any other laptops and OEMs out there. But if you repaired an iPhone logic board before, you might be familiar with these types of PCIe NANs. So now all the NANs on the right here are proprietary special NANs manufactured by these four brands we had explained in the past video. It's either Samsung, Hynix, Kyoxia or Western Digital. With all of that being said, each individual NAN is connected to the T2 chip using a single PCIe lane. And even though you see 4 NAN chips here, every single one was also programmed with proprietary NAN firmware. So each of these firmwares work together and makes the 4 NAN spared to each other and they are even numbered from 0, 1, 2 and 3. Some discussion said that these NANs are configured to RAID 0 configuration. But we can't really prove that yet. And without this critical NAN firmware, your NANs won't be able to communicate with the T2 chip. So these NANs are combined together to be treated as a single storage. And this combination determines whether you're having a total of WD500GB or maybe Kyoxia 500GB or Hynix 250GB or maybe other larger capacity. And notice that each NAND configuration has a different firmware color because this firmware is unique and very specific for every NAND combination. Yeah, in real life they don't have colors but we put them to help you understand that each of them is different and unique. Next, to make it more troublesome, Apple removed this single robust BIOS chip from the logic board. The only home to this Intel UFI firmware is now gone. And now she is so sad because she just lost her home. But Apple compassionately come to her and offer a much bigger home than her previous 8 megabyte house. And of course, Apple is offering to live inside the proprietary NANs. She is so happy having this offer to which she replied, You're so cute. 
So now, the Intel UFI and all its functional components like ME region and trusted execution engines are moving into the new home. And if you notice, each of them are equally striped into different NANs. And this is true if these NANs were configured to rate 0. But for the sake of this video and visual presentation, we're gonna make it as a single item in the NANs. So it seems all good, safe and sound since the Intel UFI is getting a new home, right? And to complete the whole T1, T2 transformation, Apple adds a tiny 4 mega byte ROM chip connected to the T2 chip here and they fill it with another firmware called iBoot. If you extract the contents inside this chip and read it with Hex Viewer, you can see the iBoot version this logic board has. Some technicians call this firmware as T2 ROM. Next, we will add another 4 nan landing pads to the T2 chip and each of them is also connected to the T2 using a single PCIe lane. Because some MacBooks like the 15 inch logic board has additional nan pads on the left side but usually there are no stuff and we will talk about that in a bit. So right now, the transformation from T1 SoC to T2 SoC has finally completed. You can pretty much say that there are two computers inside your Mac. It's like you have an iPhone integrated into your Mac logic board as the first computer and the second computer is the whole logic board with a functional Intel counterpart. So every single time you need to repair T2 logic boards, you need to solve the problem on the integrated iPhone circuit first and when everything's good on this level, only then you can find the next problem on the Intel circuitry. So so now, the Intel CPU and PCH operate properly by reading the Intel UFI from the NANs. And now, your MacBook should be able to turn on. And you will begin to install macOS to the NANs, so the macOS will take some space inside the NAND storage and becomes the neighbor of the Intel UFI. Next, you install various apps like Chrome, Photoshop, import photos and videos etc and everything works good and everyone looks happy until the real nightmare begins. When a single nun dies, just a single NAND dies on your logic board, then the whole content in the NANs will be corrupted, including the most critical Intel UFI, as well as your personal files, apps, and everything. As a result, the links between these NANs have been destroyed and the fellowship of the NAND is now broken, so during normal usage, your MacBook will experience sudden death because the critical Intel UFI is now missing and corrupted. A single NAND is all that it takes to turn this MacBook into a dead book. This is exactly the reason why you can find a lot of people over the internet complaining about sudden death issues when they're using it and along the way they would experience beach ball freezing on the screen followed by sudden shutdown. And one user even complained that his MacBook became dead after returning home from two weeks vacation and the MacBook had a normal shutdown before leaving. In other words, for MacBook 2018 and above or any T2 Mac, if your SSD dies, you will never get to see a question mark folder icon because when it's already dead, you will never be able to turn on the MacBook again. Well, from what we explained in our previous video, a single NAND can die from worn out TBW. Having a 250GB storage like this one actually made up from 464GB NANDs combination. If you assume a 250GB SSD has 150TBW of usable lifespan, then each NAND only has a 375 TBW worry-free lifespan to begin with. And we don't even talk about how well leveling works for these nuns yet. And remember, it only takes a single nun, not four, but just a single nun to kill this MacBook. And if you don't believe me, this MacBook experienced all the symptoms described just now and its logic board doesn't have any shot to ground or any kind of chip explosion or fried NANs so everything is clean and pristine. But if you measure the voltage around the NANs, all three power rails for the NANs will fluctuate to zero volt for every 23 seconds. Just a side note to our fellow technicians, this is just one of the signs a single NAN is dead because of worn out TBW. But you should do your homework and perform all voltage measurements on the rest of the logic board to make sure you are having the same exact case as this one. So don't be a monkey by blaming the NANs without making the proper measurement. So you can see all of them are clearly fluctuating to zero volt for three seconds and return back to normal voltage again. Restoring this MacBook with Apple Configurator 2 will be stuck with error 9 USB host error. For those who don't know what is this Apple Configurator 2, we will explain it again later. The simple theory for this voltage fluctuation might have to do with this unresponsive red PCIe lane. As the T2 chip unable to read the single dead NAND causing it to restart the enable voltage for every 23 seconds over and over again. And if you take the single one out NAND 
and try to reprogram it with the NaN programmer, you will finally get an error that says NaN repair fail. We will talk more about this programmer later on. With all of that being said, you're not gonna be able to replace this single dead NaN with any NaN you pull off from another donor Mac. Even if the NaN is the same exact model and brand or capacity, because the firmware inside this donor NaN is not of the same color with the ones you're trying to fix. So this is not gonna work. Next. You cannot simply replace this single dead NAN with any third-party NVMEs available from the PC markets out there because this NVME doesn't have the required Apple NAN firmware in order for it to communicate with the T2 chip unless someone in this world is genius enough to program this third-party NVME with the proprietary firmware only then maybe it might work again. So this is not gonna work too. Next, you also cannot simply remove the T2 chip and use this PCIe X4 to connect with the third-party NVMe because the T2 chip itself is now playing a major role in the system functions and has become the home to various controllers and IOs then the same trick we did to the T1 MacBook is not applicable anymore. Aww. So where can you find the NAND replacement source for all these dead Macs? Well, there are only two available sources right now and the first one is by utilizing a set of used NANDs pulled out from a donor Mac. And the second one is by installing a brand new NANDs to your logic board. So use and pull out NANDs will give you two options of repair. The first one is the direct transplant method. And the second one is the NAND programmer method. For the first method, basically you need to remove all these NANDs from the logic board even if you know some of them are not dead yet. And then you need to find a set of working NANDs to pull out from a donor board. Let's say you're taking the NANDs from a donor MacBook Air 2020 with a dead CPU and directly transplant them to this target Mac we want to repair. After soldering these pull out NANDs to the logic board, the SSD's voltage should be stable and not fluctuate anymore. But you should know and realize that these directly transplanted NANDs are not empty and the NANDs firmware section carries all the SSD stats information like the SSD's lifetime left, TBW stats and all other related SSD infos. So right now, your MacBook will never turn on because the Intel UFI inside the NAND is missing. In order to restore the correct Intel UFI, you just need to connect this logic board to another MacBook with Apple Configurator 2 installed and this specific software from Apple will help you to wipe all previous content inside the NANDs and download the new Intel UFI from Apple's server using Wi-Fi and transfer it through the cable and finally into the NANDs again. When the new Intel UFI successfully restored to the NANDs, your MacBook should be able to turn on again and you can begin to install macOS, apps, personal files and everything. Since the NANDs firmware section that came from MacBook Air is not wiped out, you can view this information later in the DriveDX apps. So it doesn't matter if you directly transplant these NANDs to MacBook Pro or Mac Mini or maybe iMac Pro, the SSD stats and TBW information here will always be the same. The pros for this direct transplant method is that all SSD stats are genuine and not reprogrammed, meaning that if you've got lucky and have the SSD with 95% and above lifespan, then it is a real value, not reprogram. And of course, for this method, you don't need any expensive programmer to reprogram the NANDs. But the cons to this method is that every NAND replacement is hit and miss. Because if you pull out the NANDs from a dead CPU logic board, you will never know the TBW and lifespan it has until you resolder them to the logic board, restore the correct Intel UFI, install macOS to the target Mac and only then you're finally able to check the SSD stats with the DriveDX apps. It's a long, tedious and winding road to only know you've got a not so good SSD. If you are a logic board technician, what will happen if you have a mad customer just because the SSD stats are bad? The second option of repair is by utilizing the NAND programmer or flasher. The concept of using this NAND flasher is pretty simple and from the name you can already understand that you can take a single NAND from any logic board and of course it comes with the NAND firmware inside it so you need to plug it into the NAND programmer and remove the original firmware inside it and reprogram the NAND with the target firmware we need. 
and this blue firmware was actually copied from another nun in China. So basically, you are creating a duplicate nun for yourself based on this nun in China. This also means that you can take any pull out nuns from any donor logic bots you have and gather all of them together to make a working nun combination. But right now, we have a problem. The firmwares inside the nuns are not binded together and not having the same color because obviously they were pulled out from various boards. Now, the zero nun at the top already flashed to blue. So what we're gonna do is to reprogram each one of them to the target firmware we need. So you need to flash the first nun to blue followed by the second nun and finally the third nun. After all of them are reprogrammed to the same color according to the numbering sequence, they're now ready to be transplanted to your target logic board and the T2 chip will easily read them as a single SSD storage. And you will be able to revive your Mac using the same Apple configurator too. This special external NAN programmer is the JCP13 made by the JC team in China. We would like to clarify this is not a sponsored video by them. It has a special NAN socket to insert your NAN and it will automatically scan your NAN model. They initially created this tool to reverse engineer the NAN's firmware for the iPhones with dead NAN storage as you can see the options for iPhone 8, iPhone 10, and iPhone 11 etc because eventually NANs on these iPhones would die too. So now, they have added the support for MacBook NANs too as you can see several Mac models are supported here. Technically, both of these iPhones and T2 Macs are using the same type of PCIe NANs but their only difference is the firmware inside them. The pros for this method is that you can pull out the NANs from various logic boards and reprogram all of them with this tool. So you don't have to rely on just one donor board like the direct transplant method and the process is quite straightforward to do. Next, you don't have to worry about your customers complaining the SSD has a bad TBW or bad lifespan left because the TBW stats you duplicated from the NANs in China are quite decent actually. But this also brings the cons to this method as we all know for a fact that these TBW stats are fake and not real. Aww. Because each of your nuns initially has a different lifespan left and different TBW stats. So when you reprogram these nuns with the firmware you downloaded from China, the firmware simply overrides and fakes the actual nun stats showing you a duplicated lifespan left as well as duplicated TBW stats. It will simply tell you a worn out 60% lifespan nun is still a good 95% even though the real nun hardware is not that capable anymore. So your customer's MacBook might be working with these nuns for some month and hopefully years, but one of the nan with the lowest actual lifespan would certainly die first. And remember, it only takes a single nan to kill your MacBook. So after wasting a lot of time explaining to you how to solder a used one out SSD, here's the third option for repair, the brand new SSD replacement. But guess what? You will not be able to buy this new SSD anywhere from the PC markets, not from AliExpress, not even from China, unless you are bold enough to pull your trigger on the Mac Pro 2019 SSD kit. So yeah, in order to buy this kit, you have to be rich enough to spend $2,800 for an 8TB SSD kit from Apple.com. So this kit is intended for the 2019 Mac Pro 7.1, but what will happen if we try to directly transplant this kit to the MacBook Pro to prove this crazy and expensive theory, we've gathered all of the money we've had from the MacBook repair and finally bought the cheapest 1TB SSD kit from the Apple website for $600. Just a quick comparison that you can get a Samsung 1TB NVMe SSD for just 100 bucks and less. So when the Mac Pro SSD kit finally arrived, we examined the box and make sure it was the right thing, then unbox the packaging and confirm that this kit looks pretty much like the iMac Pro's SSD. So before we did something destructive to this expensive SSD kit, we've decided to save more money again just to buy this completely shattered, devastated 5K LCD poor iMac Pro from eBay for $1200 and carefully tore down the shattered 5K LCD just to took out its logic board from the shell and set up a weird test bench to test multiple SSD combinations using the SSD kits we had. And the result was pretty impressive as the Mac Pro SSD kit is fully supported in the iMac Pro. Yeah! 
This successful little experiment further adds our confidence to finally transplant this 1TB Mac Pro SSD kit to our client's MacBook Pro 15 inch 2018 that suffered dead NANs from blown TPS 621AD. So basically, we removed all of the 8 NANs from the SSD kit and soldered them to this MacBook Pro one by one. We will upload the full guide video for this, so make sure to subscribe to see how we did it. Before you even ask, the NAN from this SSD kit is slightly wider than usual, so you cannot reprogram this new NAN with the JC programmer. After restoring the MacBook with the Apple Configurator 2, we were able to install the macOS and finally install the DriveDX apps to look at the TBW stats of the SSD kit. So you can see here, it has a 100% lifespan left with only 26GB TBW that was used only for installing the macOS and Intel UFI. So it's a pretty legitimate value for a new SSD kit from Apple. If you still don't believe it is possible, here's a quick view of how it looks like with 8 NAN soldered on. With all of that being said, today we want to give you a special offer to upgrade your 15-inch or 16-inch MacBook Pro to 8TB storage and we won't charge any labor fees but you have to buy this 4TB or 8TB kit and send it all together with your MacBook Logic Board to us. We guarantee 100% that it will work and succeed and we will upload the whole process to this YouTube channel. If you have the following MacBooks and your pockets are strong enough to try this, you can leave your message to our email or Facebook. But how do we know that the Mac Pro SSD kit can only be transplanted into these three MacBooks? Why can't you use the same SSD kit for MacBook Air or Mac Mini or any other Mac? Well, here's when you need the landing pads rule, the basic fundamentals of how the NANs are arranged onto the Mac's logic board. It doesn't really matter which repair method you're going to choose between these three, all of them have to obey the landing pads rule. Now, the term landing here actually came from the MacBook schematics diagram. Apple uses this term to describe how many NANs are there on a specific logic board and we believe the term landing actually came from land grid array or LGA as you might know for PC motherboards. But before we explain these rules, there are several terms you need to know and familiar with and that is FLPs, NFLPs, as well as TLPs. But don't freak out just yet, this is not a rocket science or anything you've gotta do with the thermodynamics law in engineering school, so it's really really simple to understand actually. Let's have this logic board as an example. It is the main logic board for the A2141 MacBook Pro 16-inch 2019. At the top side, you can see three of them stuffed with NANs and one pad is left unstuffed. Turn it to the other side and you will see another 3 nuns stuffed on the pads and another one pad is also left empty. Let's rearrange them so you can see better. So as you might know, each of these nuns got their own landing pad beneath. Any landing pad soldered with NAN is called functional landing pad or FLP. So we're gonna mark FLPs as green because they are functional and ready to use. When you remove a NAN from the logic board, you will get a functional landing pad beneath it because this specific landing pad has local components like capacitors and resistors around it and thus it is ready to accept another donor NAN. Unlike some landing pads like this one has no soldered NAN at all and you should notice local components around the landing pad are missing. So this pad will never work without this component and thus the name non-functional landing pads or NFLPs. So, we can precisely say that this logic board has 6 FLPs and 2 NFLPs that gives you a total of 8 TLPs or total landing pads. If you look at the landing pads chart we've created here, this is how we come up with these numbers for FLPs, NFLPs and TLPs. Let's have another example to make it clear. This A2159 MacBook Pro 13-inch 2019 has a single NAN and a no stuff at the top side and the other side also has a single NAN and a no stuff that gives you two functional landing pads and another two non-functional landing pads. So for this specific logic board, you have two FLPs, two NFLPs that end up with four TLPs. The rest of landing pads are not present on the logic board. Now you already know the meaning of FLPs or NFLPs, it is time to read the landing pads rule. Rule number zero, 
500GB limit for T2 Max. If your T2 Mac originally has a 500GB storage and lower, then your logic board can only accept storage size within this range. Meaning that, if you have a Mac with 120GB storage size from the factory, then you can upgrade the storage size to 250GB or maybe to a maximum of 500GB limit but not more than that. But if you have a stock 500GB T2 Mac from the factory, then it's quite unfortunate that it cannot be upgraded any further. If the T2 Mac has a 1TB SSD storage or higher, only then this Mac can support up to 8TB of SSD upgrade because when you buy a T2 Mac higher than 1TB SSD, Apple will give you the upgraded version of T2 chip with 2GB of RAM. But if you buy the T2 Mac within the lower range, Apple will downgrade the T2 RAM to only 1GB size. This requirement might have something to do with DRAM cache size for the whole SSD operation. So please remember this rule before saying yes to your customers who need to upgrade to 8TB SSD. Next, rule number 1. All NANs must be transplanted as a whole set, meaning that if you directly transplant 4 NANs from a donor logic board, then you must transplant all of them to the target Mac. You cannot just take 2 of them and match with other NANs because there will be firmware color mismatch. So the same case applies if you reprogram the NANs with the JC programmer as you need to reprogram all the NANs to the same color then you must transplant all of them to the target Mac. And if you directly transplant a set of NANs from the Mac Pro 2019 SSD kit, then the target Mac must have 8 FLPs to fit all the 8 NANs. Rule number 2, NANs from the lower FLPs can be transplanted to higher FLPs. This is where the FLP numbers will be handy. If you pull out a set of NANs from 4 FLP boards, like the Mac Mini 2018, you can transplant them to a 16-inch MacBook with 6 FLPs. And you can just leave the rest of the landing pads unconnected and it will work just fine. Just don't forget to cut off the 3v3 rail for the unutilized Ocarina chip. This is the reason why the landing pads chart is arranged this way as the NANs from the Mac Mini can be transplanted to upper Macs with higher FLPs. The same case will apply if you reprogram the NANs in the JC programmer and let's say you choose to duplicate two FLP NANs from the MacBook Air 2018. So after reprogramming your NANs, your duplicated NANs can now fit into all of the Mac Mini, MacBook Pro, iMac Pro or even Mac Pro with 8 FLPs. So this is how this Core i7 15-inch MacBook Pro 2019 end up with only 120GB of SSD storage just enough to keep this poor MacBook alive. Next, rule number 3, NANs from the higher FLPs cannot be transplanted to lower FLPs. This is quite obvious, right? You can't transplant 8 NANs from the Mac Pro 2019 SSD kit to the MacBook Air 2018 because you simply don't have enough FLPs. The other 5 landing pads are not present on the actual hardware, making this direct transplant method is impossible. So now you know why the 13-inch MacBooks with 4 FLPs cannot accept NANs from the Mac Pro SSD kit. Next, rule number 4, NANs from the same FLP numbers are swappable. You might already get this one. NANs that came from the same FLP numbers are interchangeable between the same class. So NANs from the Mac Mini are directly swappable with MacBook Pro 13-inch and vice versa. Rule number 5, NANs must stuff the 00 port followed by the 01 port. The first 4 FLPs at the top here belong to the 00 port and the remaining 4 FLPs represent the 01 port. So when you stuff the donor NANs, you must fill in the 00 port first, followed by the 01 port. If you never know this port's numbering exists, 
In the A1090 MacBook Pro, the 00 port is all the 4 nuns on the right wing and the 01 port is all the remaining 4 nuns on the left chicken wing. You can check it out by opening the board view for this main logic board, go to any nuns on the right wing and look for pin 87 that reads SSD 0 clock request 1. So the number 0 tells you this nun is connected to the 00 port and if you look at the other wing on the left, another nun with the same pin number 87 reads SSD 1 clock request 2. So the number 1 here tells you that this nun is connected to the 01 port. So when you stuff the nuns on this logic board, make sure to stuff them on the right wing first. But why is this really important? Because on the A2141 MacBook 16 inch, the port location is now inverted. The 00 port is now located on the left chicken wing while the 01 port is located on the right wing. So for this particular model, you need to stuff the donor nuns on the left wing first. If you don't believe me, go check your board view now. While on the iMac Pro 2017, both of the 00 and 01 ports are literally represented by these two physical ports. This port on the right here is the 00 port and the left one is the 01 port. If you look at the Mac Pro SSD kit we've bought, you can find a specific numbering on both of their PCBs that ends with 00 and 01 numbers. So this 00 SSD must be plugged into the right port and of course the 01 SSD to the left port. If you purposely install them on the wrong port, you will end up with error 9 USB host error in the Apple Configurator 2. And if you purposely remove the 01 SSD from the 01 port, you will get another error that says error 35, error formatting the NANDs. The same concept also applies to the Mac Pro 2019 that has the same physical NAND ports inside the chassis. Rule number 6, NAND sequence must follow the 0th, 1st, 2nd and 3rd order. Now, not only these two ports are numbered, but every single NAND is also numbered. On the 00, 0 port, the numbering starts from 0 to 3 and the same numbering scheme repeats for the 0, 01 port. So these NANDs are so picky and sensitive to these numberings. So to know the exact numbering for each NANDs, open up the board view for the same logic board and go to the same pin 87 that reads SSD 0 clock request 1 that tells you it's a NAND on the 00, 0 port with the first order. Let's see another one. This pin 87 reads SSD 0 clock request 2 that tells you it's a NAND on the 00, 0 port with the second order. So after numbering all donor NANDs, make sure to match them on the target board with the same ports and number, meaning that you have to mark them from 0 to 3 before pulling it off from the donor Mac and directly transplant them exactly with the same numbering order on a target Mac like 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 2 until you finish it till the end. This sensitive behavior might have to do with rate 0 striping arrangement. Don't make mistake with these numberings or else you're going to end up with error 9 USB host error. Rule number 7, NFLPs are not functional unless missing parts restored. Let's take the NANDs from this Mac Pro SSD kit, so there are a total of 8 NANDs. And you want to transplant them to the 16-inch MacBook Pro. But there is a single problem. You might have noticed you only have 6 FLPs on the 16-inch MacBook logic board and the other two pads are NFLPs. So these NFLPs are not usable unless you restore all the required capacitors and resistors around the NANDs. Because all these components are required for the NAND strapping and operation, so they must be present if you want to convert these NFLPs to FLPs. Rule number 8, NANDs brand cannot be mixed. It is quite obvious, right? You cannot mix Kyoxia NANDs with any other brand like Sandy's NANDs and the other way around. And finally folks, that's the end of the landing pads rule. If you correctly follow all of them, we will guarantee you'll be able to rescue some Macs with dead SSDs. So here's a quick recap of how to successfully replace the dead NANDs on the T2 Macs. Next. Let's move on to the M1 Max family, finally. 
So maybe this one is what you're waiting for. These are all the M series Macs that have been introduced by Apple so far, and of course, they are arranged in this chart in a way that obeys the landing pads rule. So the actual hardware for the M1 SoC is easily found when you remove the heatsink from the logic board and you should find the NANDs for this Mac nearby the M1 SoC. Then, this is how Apple fits the M1 components on the logic board compared to the previous generation T2 Mac. This time, the M1 SoC has taken the place of the T2 chip and Apple completely phased out all Intel CPUs and PCH leaving only the M1 as the main processor. Next, the old NANDs with the Intel UFI inside are not needed anymore. After removing the old NANDs, just like the T2, each NAND is hardwired to the M1 SoC by the PCIe X1 link. So Apple upgraded them with slightly power-efficient NANDs operating at lower voltage compared to the previous generation. For this reason, even though they physically look the same in dimension and design, technically we believe they're not the same and not compatible to each other. On the actual logic board hardware, you can only see a maximum of two landing pads for the regular M1 SoC, so the rest of six landing pads on this block diagram should be deleted and not present at all. And even though you see two NAND chips here, every single one was also pre-programmed with proprietary NAND firmware, so each of these firmwares work together to be treated as a single storage again, and they are also numbered with 0 and 1. And as usual, these firmwares carry the related infos regarding the SSD's lifetime left, serial number, power on time and cycle count, as well as TBW stats. To complete the T2 M1 transformation, Apple upgraded this 4MB ROM chip to 8MB size and replaced the content inside it with a new version of iBoot specifically made for the M1 SoC. And of course, you can view this iBoot version after extracting the chip's content with the external SPI programmer and view the hex dump with the hex viewer. So right now, your M1 Mac is still not able to turn on or chime yet because your NANs here are empty and have nothing inside except the NAND firmware. The thing is, all M-series Mac also need another macOS loader inside these NANs that functions just like the Intel UFI to be able to turn on or down. So, by using the same secondary MacBook setup like before, you can use the same Apple Configurator 2 to restore the macOS loader called iBoot 2. This iBoot 2 will be downloaded from Apple's online server together with the macOS Ventura and get transferred through the SBC cable and finally into the NANDs. All these processes are being done in the factory and you need to go through it again after replacing the NANDs. When both of them are successfully restored to the NANDs, your M1 MacBook should now able to turn on and of course, you can start to install various apps, import your personal files and everything else. So this is how a complete block diagram architecture looks like for a working M1 Mac. Next, we believe these PCIe NANDs actually support PCIe 4.0 or Gen 4, which explains speed for each NAND to reach plus minus 1500 MB per second of read and write. So the total speed for RAID 0 NANDs should be around plus minus 3000 MB per second of read and write, like what you get for a typical M1 MacBook. And if you buy the newer version M2 Mac, they simply swap out this M1 SoC with the M2 SoC. M2 Mac also have the same two landing pads for the NANs here, except that they usually stuffed it with only a single NAN for the base model that result in slower speed you're getting with this M2 model only around 1500 MB per second of read and write. Next, when they introduce a much powerful SoC like the M1 Max, they simply replace the ordinary M1 footprint and the NANDs landing pads are now upgraded from 2 landing pads to 8 landing pads again. For a typical M1 Max 500GB SSD configuration, you're gonna get 4 NANDs stuffed on the landing pads at the 00 port and the rest of 01 port remain unstuffed and become NFLPs. So, on the actual hardware, you should see the 4 NANDs stuffed on the left chicken wing as the 00 port and the 01 port on the right wing remains empty. Then, as you might have expected, 4 NANDs configuration will be much faster as it quadruples the speed of a single PCIe 4.0, so most people will get plus minus 6000 MB per second of read and write. The same block diagram is used even if you buy the lower performance M1 Pro SoC, so they will swap out this M1 Max and replace it with the M1 Pro. Or maybe swap it out with the set Ultimatum M1 Ultra. Okay, we don't have the actual picture for it. So now, it doesn't matter which SoC you're using, 
The logic board operates properly as the CPU can still read the iBoot loader directly from the NANDs and everything will be nice and smooth and everyone's happy with this Mac extraordinary performance. Until finally, again, one of your NAND dies, 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 dies. dies. Okay, okay, I know some of you believe SSDs can last for a good 10 years and everything we explain is brilliantly said. That's fine, you can say what you want. But why? Why is this NAND came from the M1 MacBook Air doesn't last for a good 10 years? This is a KIC 227 NAND. KIC stands for Kioxia Corporation and when you try to plug in this dead NAND inside this JC programmer, it will end up with undetected prompt. There is no short or any explosion sign on this NAND and it doesn't matter how hard you try to clean or maybe recondition this NAND but you will never get it to work. But if you try to plug in the same KIC227 NAND pull out from another working M1 Mac, the NAND programmer will easily read and identify the NAND model. This KIC227 is widely used in the first generation M1 Mac as well as the M1 Max M1 Pro Mac lineup. Well, don't get it wrong. We're not saying this that NAND came from this second generation MacBooks. Well, at least maybe not yet. And of course, when a single NAND dies, all the RAID 0 contents inside them will also be corrupted including your personal files, macOS as well as the most critical iBoot 2 loader. So as what you might have expected, the M-series Macs will experience sudden death too just like the T2 Mac. And your MacBook will never turn on again because of this corrupted iBoot 2. But that's impossible right, cause your Mac should last for 10 years. And since these NANDs were pre-programmed with proprietary NAND firmware, your NANDs replacement options should be limited to the same three choices we explained before. But unfortunately, the only available option right now is the direct transplant method. The other two are not even an option right now because the NAND programmer JCP13 currently doesn't have the options for the M1 Mac at all as you can see only the T2 Macs listed here. If you try to plug in the M1 NANDs inside this programmer, it can correctly identify the NAND model KIC227 but there is no specific option to reprogram the M1 NANDs. And if you try to duplicate the NANDs manually using this read and write function, your Mac will end up with various errors in Apple Configurator too. Most probably the JC team is still working hard on this but we can't really guarantee if one day they'll figure it out and I hope they finally will. Next, for the new NAND option, we cannot buy it directly from Apple yet because at the time we upload this video, the most awaited Mac Pro with Apple Silicon is not even announced yet. So you can't buy the Mac Pro SSD kit yet and thus this is not even an option. With all of that being said, direct transplant method simply means you need to transplant a full set of donor NANDs from a good working M1 Mac to the dead SSD Mac. But if you notice, the landing pad chart for the M-series Mac has a several color regions. The blue region at the top includes all the tested NAND compatibility for M1 Max M1 Pro model and please note that the NANDs can only be transplanted within the same blue region. This is confirmed by swapping the NANDs back and forth on several 14-inch and 16-inch MacBooks we have. Next, the grey region is what we call the grey area that includes all models that are not tested and swapped yet, including the M1 iPad and the M2 Mac. So one day after we finally tested them one by one, it's either going to the blue region or maybe to the green region. You can also test it if you want and tell us the result for us to update this chart. Then, the green region is all the first generation M1 Mac and of course, NANDs can only be transplanted within the same green region. This is confirmed when we tried to transplant the NANDs in the green region to the blue region such as transplanting NANDs from the M1 Mac Mini to the 14-inch M1 Pro MacBook but we finally got an error that says Error 21 Library USB Restore. So the only way to cross the color region is by using the NAND programmer like combining two sets of NANDs from the green region and reprogramming them to make a complete set of NANDs for the blue region. 
but this idea is still impossible because the JC programmer is not ready for this kind of task. So that's it, the same landing pads rule applies to do this successfully, but one rule has changed and removed. Rule number 0 that states the 500GB restriction is not applicable anymore because for the M1, you can have a 2TB SSD with only 8GB RAM configuration. Every other rule is pretty much the same just like how we explained for the T2 Max. We're not gonna go through each of them for now, but we want to highlight the rule number 5 regarding the 00 port and 01 port. Rule number 5, NANS must stuff the 00 port followed by the 01 port. Let's take this M1 Max 16-inch logic board as an example. You can see there are 4 NANS on the left chicken wing and this is a 1TB SSD configuration. And then, as you can see nothing on the right wing but only the NAND landing pads, by following rule number 5, we can safely assume the left wing is the 00 port and the right wing is the 01 port. To confirm this, open the FlexBV board viewer by Paul Daniel, and yeah, he's not sponsoring this video, so you can see this is exactly the 16-inch M1 Max logic board, and as you go to any NANs on the left wing, pin 87 shows you the NAND address that reads NAN0 Cloud Request 2 RL that tells you it's a NAN on 00 port with the second order. If you check all four NANs on this wing, all of them start with NAN0 that addresses the 00 port. On the other hand, any NANs on the right wing, pin 87 starts with NAN1 Cloud Request RL. The number one here addresses the 01 port. Then, right now we all can agree the left wing is 00 port and the right wing is the 01 port, right? So, by using the same strategy, we can now evaluate why all these famous YouTubers failed to perform the SSD swap on the Mac Studio. We will put the links to their videos in the description and the following clips we're about to discuss are respectfully owned by them. In the first video, Luke Miani started with two Mac Studio, both of them are the M1 Ultra Mac Studio with a 1TB of SSD size. So he started to disassemble the first Mac Studio and got to the point where the removable NANs were accessible. Before we proceed any further, this clip shows that the 00 port for the M1 Ultra configuration is located on the left side of the Mac Studio, and the empty port on the right here is the 01 port, because by default, the four NANs are stuffed on the left side, just like how you saw for the 16-inch logic board just now, except that the 4 NANs are now removable on a separate PCB. You can cross-check the M1 Ultra teardown by MaxTech and you should see the stock NANs are also stuffed on the left board. Back to Lukmiani's channel, so basically he took the NANs from the 00 port of the first Mac Studio and plugged it into the 01 port of the second Mac Studio. So if we illustrate what he did on the block diagram, this is what you will see. He basically moved 4 NANs from the 00 port of the first Mac Studio to the 01 port of the second Mac Studio to make a combination of 2TB SSD. But please note that the firmware color here is not the same and the donor NANs were pre-programmed to only work with the 00 port, not 01. So this is not gonna work. Next, in the second attempt, he took the original NANs from the 00 port of the same Mac Studio and moved it to the 01 port. So to illustrate that on a block diagram, it will look like just a simple port swap. But since these NANs were pre-programmed to only work with the 00 port, not 01, then this is not gonna work too, even if you try to restore it with the Apple Configurator too. Next, in the third attempt, he basically swapped the two NANs between the Mac Studios to the 00 port. So if we illustrate what he did on the block diagram, this is what you will see. So this one is supposed to work, but since he didn't perform the DFE restore using the Apple Configurator 2, then he missed the chance to get it recorded on camera, but that's completely fine. In the second follow-up video Mr. Miani posted, he came up with another Mac Studio, but this time, the NAND swap was going to be between the M1 Ultra and the M1 Max model. In the video, he found that the position of the NANs for the M1 Max model is now inverted and located on the right side of the Mac Studio as opposed to the M1 Ultra. If you look at other teardown videos by Linus Tech Tips or iFixit, the default NAND position for the M1 Max model is also located on the right side of the Mac Studio. 
then we can safely assume that the 00 port for the M1 Max configuration is located on the right side. Well, the fact that it differs from the M1 Ultra is simply because different PCB routing is required for a different SoC. So, Mr. Miani repeated the experiment by combining NANs from the M1 Ultra into the M1 Max to make a total of 1.5TB SSD size, meaning that he plugged in that 1TB NANs from the 00 port into the 01 port. And of course, it ended with Area 21 Library USB Restore. Frustrated with the result, he finally swapped the original NANs into the respective Mac Studios and performed the FE Restore. And of course, it succeeded to restore without any problem. The same thing happened to Linus Tech Tips when he tried to swap the NANs on both of their Mac Studios. And thank goodness, he began with a simple NAN swap on the same 00 port. So of course, on the first attempt, he looks so happy knowing that you can actually swap the NANs on these Mac Studios. But he quickly turned to frustration as combining both NANs to the same Mac Studio didn't work. Because he simply populated the 01 port with the 00 port NANs and ended with error 6 failed to handle message. That was also the case for iFixit's attempt to swap the NANs on both of their Mac Studios and I think we don't need to explain it again. With all of that being said, if they ever want to revisit the experiment now and still want to try to upgrade the NANs, the only way to successfully perform the upgrade is by buying the base model of Mac Studio from the Apple website, M1 Mac CPU is fine, but make sure to don't forget to customize the SSD storage to at least 4TB SSD size or higher to force Apple to stuff both of the 00 and 01 ports, meaning that Apple will give you 2TB of NANs per port. After you receive the 4TB Mac Studio, you can begin to tear it down and before you remove both of the NANs, label them with the respective ports number and then you can finally swap them out to any M1 Ultra Mac Studio with the correct ports position and restore it with the Apple Configurator 2. To illustrate this on a block diagram, this is what you will see. Well, obviously we're not gonna do this experiment now because of time and money constraints as we have spent a lot of money by purchasing the 14 inch and 16 inch just to perform the sorted non swap. So that's it folks, here's just a quick recap of how to successfully replace the onboard SSDs for the M series Mac. Yay! And things could've been a lot better if Apple starts selling new, individual NANs just like how they sell the Mac Pro SSD kit on their website. Or maybe they can start selling through their independent repair program so that people like you don't have to worry about dead SSD issues and people like me don't have to sacrifice a good working MacBook just so you can have good SSDs with good TBW stats and ultimately, we don't have to scavenge one out donor NANs from dead logic boards from eBay because you know, these logic boards came from those people that said, Oh, SSD swap use is fine. SSDs can last for 10 years, you know. And when Apple starts selling new NANs, they can actually make more money by designing the MacBooks with built in NAN sockets. So whenever your SSD dies, you can easily remove the old ones and buy the new one from Apple and install them to the logic board yourself. Don't deny this Apple. You had these NAN sockets during the prototype stage and you decided to remove them for the mass production. Why didn't you just leave it there? We kind of guarantee you will sell more MacBooks when you make the storage removable. Well, if both of these suggestions are rejected, then someone like the NAN manufacturer, like the Chinese NAN manufacturer, why can't you just create new, customly designed NAN exactly like this with whatever 3D NAN or VNAN, SLC, QLC, MLC or anything you can come up with as long as it is new and not worn out yet and program it with the Apple NAN firmware used in the JC programmer. Then boom! You don't have to worry about NAN source anymore. Well, that's all what we have. But it doesn't mean we are 100% agree with all of these pro-capitalist suggestions. But at least, it is much better than having none. The last solution is what most people will say. Stop buying them. Well, does it really will stop anything? I don't know. Let us know your thoughts in the comments and we're gonna keep doing modifications to existing MacBooks and see you again at iBoff RCC channel, reverse engineering at its best. Have a good one and thanks for watching.